In this lecture, we're going to talk about the basics of equine dental care, um, talk some about equine nutrition, and then close out talking a little bit about equine gastric ulcers. Um, dental care is a, is a major issue um, with horses that we don't have to deal with as much um, with our other um, large animals. And there are a couple of reasons for that that you need to remember. Um, one is horse teeth grow continuously. Um, so they're going to grow continuously throughout life. And their teeth will wear down as they chew or grind their food. Um, those horses tend to chew laterally side to side um, as they grind their food, and that's going to wear those teeth down. Um, also, the horses, when they reach down to, to pick grass and raise their head to chew, that, that jaw position changes constantly, and that causes teeth wear. Um, how quickly those teeth wear depends on the diet. Um, and so grasses where there's a lot of silica or sand, um, you're going to see those teeth wear more quickly um, than those horses that are on an all-grain or an all-concentrated diet um, that doesn't wear the teeth as much. And so more grass in the diet is going to increase wear on teeth, decrease grass in the diet is going to decrease wear on teeth. Um, the, the horse teeth um, have a tendency to wear unevenly over time, which can cause the horses to chew more vertically than laterally. This is not good. Normally they should chew side to side. This leads to improper chewing, improper breakdown of food, and nutrients can be lost. And so before we get into the anatomy, um, I've been asked by people, um, why do you want to work on my horse's teeth? Wild horses never had an equine dentist and they made it fine. Well, there are several differences in wild horses and domestic horses. Um, one of those differences is those wild horses um, do a lot more natural grazing in their natural environment than our domestic horses. Um, they're out, um, a lot of those horses were out west with a lot of silica in the diet. Um, they're grazing on coarse grasses and shrubs which wore the teeth more. Um, another important point with those wild horses, um, there weren't too many wild horses that lived to be 15, much less 30. And so our domestic horses live a lot longer which uh, gives a lot more time for improper wear of the teeth and dental problems. Um, those wild horses also tend to do all their grazing on the ground where um, a lot of our domestic horses, the, the hays and feed racks or hay rings, um, feed troughs, and so they're not raising and lowering their head as much, which affects wear. And so the environment, the type of feed, and the type of grazing the wild horses do made a difference, but probably the biggest difference is that lifespan. Um, wild horses didn't have a long lifespan where um, it's it's very common for domestic horses to live 15, 20, 25, some even 30 years, and so a lot more time um, for, for them to develop teeth problems. So one important point on why horses require dental care is their teeth grow continuously. Um, another important point is the top jaw or the top molars are wider than the bottom molars. And so when the horses chew from side to side, that top jaw is wider bottom jaws narrower, you're going to see points form on the outside um, of the upper molars and the inside of the lower molars. And so you can see in that drawing at the bottom when those hooks and points form um, outside on the upper jaw, the upper molars, inside on the lower. Um, here's another diagram to show you. This is not a diagram. It's actually a, um, a specimen that's been cut in cross section. And you can see those top teeth are quite a bit wider than the lower teeth. Um, and so as that horse chews side to side, you can see how those teeth are going to grind and how it's going to leave. Um, it's not going to grind on the inside of the lower, which is going to leave hooks and points, and it's not going to grind on the outside of the upper, which will leave hooks and points. Um, these hooks and points um, can be sharp, um, be very sharp if you've ever felt those. They will you know, cut your hand, um, and so they can certainly cut, cut the cheek on the horse. They can cause tooth fractures. Um, they can lead to drop food. Um, and difficulty chewing. Um, so they can be very uncomfortable and cause problems for the horses. Um, here's another picture to show you. You can see on the outside of that upper jaw some points starting to form um, that um, we can quickly um, file off and level out those teeth. Um, here's an endoscopic view where a camera has been taken into the mouth and you can see um, that lower arcade um, with those sharp points forming on the inside and how they can cut the cheek and the tongue um, as, as the animal chews. Um, here's another one showing you big ulcer on the tongue um, where there's sharp points on, on the inside of those lower teeth. Um, as the animal chews, they, they hit the tongue, causing discomfort and ulcers. Um, here is a, a, 
a skull and uh, the teeth are still in and you can see on those very back teeth um, very sharp points back there that have built up over time as the animal chewed which you can imagine um, will cause some discomfort um, as you chew. Um, here's another one showing you the whole uh, the whole line with those points on every tooth on the lower arcade on the inside. So clinically what do we see with dental problems? The horses start to eat more slowly. Um, very often you'll see them tip their head to the side when they're chewing um, to try to avoid those points and hooks and to be able to chew properly. Um, as the problems progress, a lot of times you'll see them drop food from their mouth while they eat. So, so they're, they're chewing and they're eating, but food's falling out. Um, other things we can see as those hooks and points develop, they'll develop resistance to the bridle and bit. Um, and then you can also see the cheek or tongue ulcers as you saw in those pictures. So routine dental care in horses is important. Um, it increases their ability to utilize feed. Um, it's uh, going to be important for their comfort, for their health, and their performance. And so how often do we need to check teeth on horses? Um, every horse should have their teeth checked every year. Um, that's the, the best advice I can give you is check the teeth on every horse every year. Some horses are going to need dental work every six months. Some horses are going to need dental work every five or six years. Um, but the only way to know is to check every horse every year. Um, if you ask me for an average, I'd say, you know, uh, a lot of horses need to be floated or filed every two to three years. But I've seen horses that needed it every six months. I've seen horses that were 15 that still had really good teeth without a lot of hooks and points that didn't need filing. So it varies with individuals. But the safe thing, check every horse every year to determine what they need. Um, and yearly floatings can be given um, when needed and necessary. Um, floating is a term we use. Uh, floating is really just filing or rasping those hooks and points off the teeth. And so um, you can see in the diagram there, um, there are hand floats or hand rasps. And you take those rasps and you go down the inside of those lower teeth and file those points off. And you go down the outside of the upper teeth and file those points down. Um, that's what floating is. There are also power floats on the market, um, which are... Um, much easier to use um, the power tools are but have to be a little more careful with those and, and they make a little noise so we um, typically need a little more restraint for the horses um, and often use sedation when we use power floats but um, a, lot of, a lot of tools available out there um, to take care of these horse teeth here's a pretty typical floating procedure that horses in stocks um, and she's using a power float to, to balance those teeth out um, another issue with teeth in horses that you hear about, I just want you to be aware of, are wolf teeth. Um, wolf teeth, 75% of horses are going to have wolf teeth on their upper arcade, so 25% will not. Um, it's upper premolar one, so when you label teeth, premolars come before the molars. Um, this would be the first premolar. It's vestigial, which means simply means it's not fully formed. Um, the wolf tooth has no function. It's, a, it's an extra tooth. Um, wolf teeth are very, very rare on the lower arcade. And here's a diagram of what the wolf teeth look like. And why are we talking about wolf teeth? Well, a lot of people want wolf teeth removed because they can interfere with the bit. Um, but there's also a lot of confusion over wolf teeth. I've had several people come to me with horses and say, I need you to pull the wolf teeth, and they point to the canines. Well, those canines... Um, are not vestigial. They are the canines are fully formed. They have deep roots. They're very difficult to extract, and they don't cause a problem with the bridle and bit. Um, so you don't want to confuse a wolf tooth and a canine tooth. Um, there's typically it's pretty rare to have wolf teeth on the lower arcade. Only about 75% will have on the upper arcade. Um, when you truly have wolf teeth, um, they're relatively easy to remove, and they certainly um, can cause a problem with the bridle and bit. Um, based on where exactly they're located. You can also see on that diagram they've pointed out a big frontal hook um, on that front tooth that needs to be filed down. Uh, just another diagram to show you the wolf teeth um, in relationship to the canines. Those canines are, are up front, closer to your incisor. That wolf teeth is going to be the first premolar right back there close to your molars. Again, traditionally these wolf teeth are removed because they can interfere with the bit. Um, there's another endoscopic or camera view going into horse's mouth, and you can see those wolf teeth. They're small. They're not fully formed. Um, usually pretty easy to remove um, without a problem. And uh, a lot of trainers want them removed early so horses don't develop bad habits with their mouth and the bit. Let's talk about equine nutrition um, 
for uh, a few minutes and, and that will lead into a short discussion of colic. Um, horses are non-ruminant herbivores, so when we talked about cattle and, and small ruminant nutrition, we talked about um, the four-chamber stomach and the rumen was the fermentation vat where um, a lot of the, the forage and the plant products are broken down. Well, horses are also um, herbivores, but they don't have a ruminant. And the way that happens is they are what we call hind gut fermenters, and so fermentation takes place in the rear gut, and a lot of that takes place in the cecum. And so horses typically are going to graze about 16 hours per day, and then I've got a lot of numbers on there that I don't expect you to memorize, but if you look at the bottom, um, they have a total of over 75 feet of intestine and, and over a 35 gallon capacity. So even though they don't have that one big large rumen, um, there's a lot of space in those intestines for bacteria and for um, food digestion and breakdown. And again, the, the cecum is a place where a lot of that fermentation will take place in a horse. And there's a diagram of what that um, equine tract looks like. It's going to start with the stomach, which is A, and that's going to move into the small intestine. The small intestine has three parts, um, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Um, that small intestine is going to go into the cecum. Um, the cecum is labeled C on that diagram. And the cecum is easy to pick out because it is um, the only um, the only organ in there that has an end. And if you look at where that C is, that cecum comes to an end. So food comes in the small intestine, has to go in the cecum, and then move around and go back out into the large intestine. Um, the cecum is a common place where we see impactions. And you can look at that diagram and understand why. Um, food doesn't just move straight through like it does the rest of the GI tract. Comes in one opening, has to go around, and then out. So that's a, it's not an uncommon place for an impaction, which is one of the one of the things that leads to equine colic. Um, D is the large intestine, um, and then um, E is the the colon, which leads into the rectum. And so um, know how this anatomy differs from ruminant anatomy, but at the end of the day, um, the functions. Um, are very similar, um, but different anatomy to, to get the job done for digestion. So when we look at equine nutrition, the, the first point you need to remember is horses should eat predominantly forage. Um, I think we have some people out there that think horses should eat feed first and forage second. Um, horses, horses are designed to eat predominantly forage. And excessive feeding of grain leads to many problems. Um, metabolic diseases, laminitis, obesity, arthritis, and so a lot of people overfeed their horses' grain. Um, horses, just like our ruminants, there should be a good free choice mineral supplement available um, or fed to them all the time. And so the question comes up, how much grain should we feed? Well, that answer is going to vary based on what the animal is used for. Um, but remember, most horses in the world um, are pasture pets and they don't work that hard. They don't need a lot of grain. Um, we feed grain because it makes us feel better. We feed grain because they come up and we want to check them every day, which is good. But when you do that, um, feed them a small amount of grain. You know, uh, uh, one of the big coffee cans may hold um, three or four pounds of feed. Um, and if you feed that twice a day, you're quickly getting into a whole lot of grain in that animal. Um, feed, a, feed a cup. Um, to get them to come up every day. A small amount, animals will do better. Now, true performance horses that are working really hard multiple hours per day every day, they're going to need more grain than those horses that don't do anything or that go trail ride on the weekend or that ride 30 minutes twice a week. Um, but high quality forage should be the biggest part of that diet. And when high quality forage is the biggest part of the diet, you're going to see a lot fewer health problems um, in horses got a couple of articles for you to read on equine parasites um, that are going to go into, into detail on different parasites, but I want to talk about one parasite here um, that's a little bit different than what we've talked about with cattle and small ruminants, and that's the equine tapeworm. And uh, the name of that tapeworm is Anaplacephala perfoliata, and that's a picture of it in the upper right corner of that slide. Um, Anaplacephala, I'm talking about it because it's very difficult to diagnose. Um, Anaplacephala doesn't lay a lot of eggs, so if you do fecal exams, you, they can have Anaplacephala, but you may not see eggs. Also, those eggs don't float well in the fecal solution, which makes them harder to ID. But those tapeworms congregate at the ileocecal junction, so where the small intestine meets the cecum, um, that's where those worms like to be. 
You can also see on the fecal material down at the bottom, you can see the adult tapeworms as they pass. Again, it's not common to see them in the feces, but you can. Um, and so if we go back to where does anaplocephala live, Iliocecal junction, so where your small intestine B, the ileum, comes in and hits C. That's where they like to be. And if you look, um, it's a pretty narrow opening. And so if you put a lot of tapeworms right there, um, they can cause an impaction and they can cause severe colics. So they're a little bit hard to diagnose. Um, they can cause major problems. Um, the good news is it's very simple to kill or eliminate these worms. And there are a lot of products on the market that do that. Um, this chart was put out by Pfizer, but um, percentage of horses infected with tapeworms you can see throughout the country. Some areas, tapeworms are a bigger problem than others, but they're present all over the country. Um, as a general rule, your plus products take care of tapeworms. So Zemectrin Gold um, is an example. Anything that's a gold or a plus is something that's going to take care of tapeworms. My recommendation is to use a plus product at least once a year. Um, you can use a plus product every time, but at least use it once a year. Quest Plus is another example, um, and you won't have problems with tapeworms. And then the other parasites we worry about, um, you'll read about and talk about in your articles, and their life cycles are similar to what we looked at with homonchus and small ruminants. We'll talk for just a few minutes about colic. Um, can't talk about horses without mentioning colic. Um, colic is one of the most severe and costly equine problems. It's estimated that one in ten horses each year will colic. Um, one thing I want you to be aware of is colic is not a disease. Um, colic is a term that means stomach pain. Okay, so colic is a very general term. There are a lot of things that can cause stomach or abdominal pain, um, but colic is a general term to describe that. So if somebody says my horse has got the colic, it means he's got abdominal pain. But what's causing that colic? Um, that's what's really important. When you look at colic in the horse or abdominal pain, um, the first reaction um, the body makes to intestinal problems is it's going to increase the secretion of digestive juices. So when something's not going right in all that intestine, the first response uh, the body's going to make is secrete digestive juices. Well, when that happens, it's going to increase pressure in the intestine. Um, then these animals with certain types of um, intestinal disease can get dehydrated, electrolytes imbalanced, and go into shock and they can die. So when, when horse people, when equine people talk about colic, um, they tend to think about the worst types of colic. Um, anything that slows the intestine down or paralyzes the intestine, slows it down, can also um, cause problems as things build up and, and eventually if things don't start back moving, um, that starts to leak in the abdomen and you can get peritonitis and death. So some of these syndromes that lead to colic um, can be very severe and um, it's not colic something that makes uh, most horse owners panic. Um, when you look at what, it, what are signs of colic or what are signs of abdominal pain, the early mild signs are a lot of these horses are going to paw at the ground, um, they may sweat a little bit, they'll turn around, they'll just look at their belly until something's wrong. Um, some will stomp their feet and become restless and some of them will lay down. As those signs progress and become more severe, um, these animals will paw at the ground violently. Um, they can have muscle tremors and strain. Um, a lot of times the male horses will stretch out and they'll urinate or just dribble a little bit. Um, they can then start violent kicking, um, roll on their back. Uh, sweat profusely, they're just soaking wet constantly up and down, sit on the haunches. So um, those are signs of severe colic. Um, other signs of severe colic are mucous membrane color. Those bad colics, if uh, that horse has had an intestine that's twisted, um, that intestine's starting to die, they're going to get, uh, those in, in mucous membrane's going to get dark and injected. Um, a lot of these horses will have a fever. Um, heart rate's a big indicator of how severe is the colic. Really high heart rate goes with severe colic. Uh, are the gut sounds or other things we check? You listen with the stethoscope. Are those guts moving and working, or are they silent? And silence is a is a bad sign. And is that horse passing fecal material? Are they having bowel movements? Another important question to ask when evaluating colics. So what are all the different things that can cause colics? Well, it's a lengthy list. Um, I've put a few things here. Uh, overeating can cause colic. Um, animal eats too much, particularly grain. Um, some animals um, will do 
um, will have wind sucking or they'll suck wind when they exercise. So that increases grass in the intestine, or increases gas in the intestine. And that gas causes the intestines to stretch. Well, the pain receptors in the intestine are stretch receptors. So anything that causes those intestines to stretch is going to cause pain. And so excess gas can cause colic. And sometimes, um, s sometimes gas colics can look really bad. Those horses, uh, you think it's a severe colic and, and wonder if they're going to make it because they're extremely painful. Then they pass gas and they're relaxed and fine. Um, diet changes can cause colics. Parasites can cause colics. We talked about anaplocephala, the profiliata, the tapeworm. Um, that tapeworm can cause a blockage. Um, other parasites can migrate and cause pain. Um, impactions are fairly common colics that are out there, or causes of colics that are out there. Um, the, the cecum is a common place for an impaction. Animals don't chew their grain, their forage as well, their rough course forages. For whatever reason, they don't drink well, and that food material starts to back up um, and cause a blockage or an impaction in the cecum. Um, then things build up behind those intestines stretch, they become painful. If you don't remove that impaction, you can have ruptured bowel or, or bowel that leaks, and those animals are, are not going to make it. Some parts of the world, there's a lot of sand. Horses ingest a lot of sand, and you can see sand colics. Um, and there are actually supplements you can keep those horses on to, to keep sand from building up in the intestine. And then probably the worst of all colics are the, the dreaded twist. And this is where small intestines can twist things. Um, bowel flips over, um, which puts it in the wrong location and cuts off blood supply. Blood supply. And uh, then those sections of intestine start to die. And if you go back and look at that slide, that's what's going on in that picture. That's a, a small intestinal twist. Um, and so that intestine's flipped, it's lost blood supply, and that dark purple intestine um, is dead. It's necrotic. Um, so how do we prevent colic? Um, you know, there's a lot of causes, so there's a, it's tough to prevent um, all types of colic, but there are a lot of factors that go into it. One is feed a good quality diet with predominantly forage. Um, provide plenty of good, clean water at all times. These animals don't get dehydrated, which leads to an impaction. Control parasites is something that we can control and reduce the number of colics. Keep the teeth in good shape so the, the horses chew their... Um, chew their feed, and, um, and that's going to decrease the risk of impaction and intestinal problems. Um, so that's a uh, colic, something you could spend a whole semester on. I've hit the highlights um, just so you understand. Colic's abdominal pain. There are a lot of things that can cause colic, um, and there are some things we can do to prevent colic. Some of the twists and things, there's nothing you can do to prevent. But some of these more common um, types of colic we can prevent. I also want to touch just briefly on laminitis. Um, laminitis, or it's commonly called founder, F-O-U-N-D-E-R, in the horse world. Um, it's another another thing that horse owners don't want to talk about or hear about in their horses. It's a it's a dreaded um, it's a dreaded problem. Um, what happens with laminitis is um, the lamina become inflamed. And if you look at that drawing, you can see um, the distal phalanx, or P3, it's attached to the hoof wall. And in between there are lamina, and they they hold or support P3 and keep it in the proper location. And, and P3 should be parallel to that dorsal hoof wall. Um, when those lamina become inflamed, P3 drops, and it, it angles down towards the bottom of the sole. And instead of walk, horse walking on the sole, the nice cushion, they begin to walk more on P3, um, which is extremely painful. Um, this horse died or was euthanized because of founder. You can see the top arrow extreme inflammation um, coming down there. Um, and then if you look at the bottom arrow, you can see where um, that P3 is almost um, come through the sole. That horse is al was almost walking on the bone, a lot of inflammation and blood. There's a good chance P3 is chipped on the end. The horse was in a lot of pain. And then if you'll notice, um, P3 is not parallel to the hoof wall. It's, uh, it's rotated down quite a bit. So that's a severe case of laminitis. Um, there's a, another example when you look um, at the bottom of that sole. Um, P3 has come down, and it's actually um, coming through 
the cell. So the animal's not walking on its cell, it's walking on P3, a severe case of laminitis or founder. Um, there's an x-ray. Um, you see the tack on the bottom. That's to give you an idea of the thickness of the sole. And again, if you look at that line, that's on the dorsal hoof wall. P3 should be parallel to that. But you can see P3 is rotated down. Um, there's also a lot, of, a lot of other problems in that x-ray. You can see on the tip of P3, it looks kind of fuzzy or rough. That's where there's remodeling where it's been under a lot of pressure and there's been damage to P3. So laminitis, P3 rotates down. Um, there's uh, a horse that's had chronic bouts of laminitis, and you can see rings on the outside of the foot, um, and that hoof is growing abnormally. And then the picture on the right is a classic horse with acute laminitis. These horses um, really, really painful. It's hard for them to stand. Um, hurts really bad. So the front feet are out. They're trying to lean back, and the horse is trying to lean back and take its weight off of its front feet. Um, with laminitis or founder, there are a lot of causes. Some overeating is a cause. There are genetic causes. Uh, metabolic syndromes can cause um, laminitis. Um, any kind of systemic illness, high fever, can lead to laminitis. Um, and so um, it's important to maintain proper diets, good health programs to prevent disease. Um, will go a long way to reducing laminitis. If a horse does founder or have laminitis, um, depending on how severe it is, um, laminitis is not reversible. Mild cases can be treated with corrective shoeing, um, but severe cases cannot be corrected, and, and a lot of these horses end up um, being euthanized. Um, again, there have been books written on laminitis. Um, we just hit the highlights. I want you to be familiar with the terminology um, and the basics of what happens. And if you're really interested in equine medicine or um, equine lameness, um, you'll, you'll study this a lot more as you move forward in your careers. Last thing I want to talk about briefly is equine gastric ulcer syndrome, um, another health problem that's uh, very prevalent in horses. Um, it's most common in thoroughbreds that are in racing and training, and studies have shown that um, up to 100% of young thoroughbreds in training will have equine gastric ulcers. Um, we also see it in standard breads and uh, to a lesser degree, but I mean 40% is still a lot um, of the elite western performance horses. Just a little background. Um, the stomach in a horse is divided into two distinct regions. You have the esophageal or non-glandular region, um, and then you have the glandular region. Um, that esophageal or non-glandular region is the, is the upper one-third of the stomach. Um, it doesn't have any glands that produce um, HCL, and it doesn't have any um, factors to protect against ulceration. And so there shouldn't be a lot of acid in the non-glandular or upper part of the stomach. There's not anything there to protect the stomach from acid, so there shouldn't be a lot of acid. Okay, so there's decreased protection. The glandular stomach, or the bottom part of the stomach, has a lot of things. It has the glands that secrete hydrochloric acid and pepsid and bicarbonate and mucus and buffers and all these things to protect it from the acid. So the bottom part of that the stomach's where the acid should be. The bottom part of the stomach has protective factors where the acid doesn't hurt the stomach. Um, what happens with gastric ulcer disease is you get acid, too much acid in the upper part of the stomach, which causes ulcerations in the lining of the stomach. Um, anatomically, the margo plicatus is the, is the sharp line which separates the um, glandular from the non-glandular part of the stomach. And so what should happen with the horse stomach is um, that horse stomach is going to make hydrochloric acid throughout the day and night, and it's going to secrete it with or without the presence of feed. Um, foals start to secrete HCL as early as two days of age, um, and adults may secrete up to a liter and a half of gastric fluid per hour. But when horses eat, um, gastric emptying is going to occur within 30 minutes, and so complete gastric emptying of roughage is going to usually occur within 24 hours. And so what should happen is there's going to be a balance there. Horses make hydrochloric acid, they also make buffers, and that's constantly going to be um, moved out as the horses eat. So what happens when things go wrong? What causes gastric ulcers? And very simply, we get acid in contact with the upper part of the stomach. And so there's not protective factors there. Acid gets in that region and ulcers form. Um, one thing on the bottom of that slide that I should have in bold, but I don't, are anti-inflammatories also make horses more prone to ulcers. And so if you take pharmacology, you'll learn the, the method behind that. 
um, but just know that anti-inflammatories, um, especially in high doses or repeated doses, can lead to ulcers. It's no different than if we take um, high doses of aspirin every day, it's going to eventually lead to ulcers. Anti-inflammatories in horses can also lead to ulcers. Um, other things that can lead to ulcers are um, fasting. And so horses should eat pretty much continuously throughout the day. Um, if you watch a horse out in the pasture, they're going to eat pretty continuously. Um, when they do that, they're also chewing continuously, which produces saliva, which is a buffer, um, which is going to decrease gastric ulceration. But they're also going to be, uh, stomach's going to be emptying on a regular basis. And they have that normal movement of um, eat, food break down, move it out of the stomach. But when we fast these animals, um, that normal cycle changes and they're more likely to have more acid and that acid is more likely to come into contact with the upper part of the stomach which is not protected. Um, again, um, saliva is rich in buffers which prevents it. And so think about it, if a horse chews all day, they're making more saliva all day. But if we feed that same horse um, one block of hay and one um, scoop of grain twice a day, it's going to eat for two hours a day. It's only going to chew for two hours a day. It's going to make a lot less saliva, so there's going to be more acid buildup, less buffers. That horse is going to be more prone to ulcers. So um, once daily feeding leads, um, is, makes horses more prone to gastric ulcers, and free choice feeding is a lot better option. But if you go back to these animals in training, um, they spend a lot of the day in training. So they eat early, they train, they eat late. Um, that's one of the factors that leads to gastric ulcers. Anything that slows things moving through the stomach um, is going to increase acid exposure. So any kind of disease, um, anything that, that affects gastric motility or emptying, and, and a big part of that is how often are the horses eating? Are they eating continuously throughout the day? Are they eating big meals twice a day? Those that eat continuously are going to have fewer ulcers than those that eat two meals a day. Um, what signs do we see with ulcers? I'm just going to tell you, ulcers can be hard to diagnose. Um, sometimes you just see intermittent colic. These animals are just uncomfortable after they eat. Sometimes they lay around, they'll, they won't nurse regularly. Um, some of the foals will have diarrhea. They can grind their teeth with bad ulcers, and a few of them will have excessive salivation. In adult performance horses, um, one of the other causes is exercise and abdominal pressure it can cause more ulcers. So one's the diet, when they eat, how much they eat, how often they eat, and then two, actually the the exercise and the pressure in that abdomen during the day can make that acid more likely to reach the upper part of the stomach. Um, and so exercise, high levels of exercise can increase the risk of ulcers um, on top of the way um, they eat and their diet. When you think about um, clinical signs in adult horses, again, they can be hard to diagnose. Sometimes they just have a weak appetite. Sometimes they'll eat, but they won't finish their food or they'll just pick at their food. Um, they can have intermittent colic episodes where they appear uncomfortable. Well, sometimes they just don't perform well. Uh, you've had a horse that performs really well and suddenly they don't perform as well. They can lose weight, they can have a rough hair coat, they can lay around a lot, but um, can be a challenge to diagnose just based on clinical signs. The best way to diagnose gastric ulcers is through an endoscope, so that camera on a scope. You sedate the horses, you run a camera down into their stomach and you look around. Are there ulcers there or are there not? Um, the only negative with an endoscopic exam is it's fairly costly. Um, if people won't do an endoscope, we can try to reel everything else and, and treat the animals and see if they improve. But the, the best test is endoscopic exam. Um, to treat ulcers, um, there's only one approved treatment on the market. It's called Gastrogard, um, and its active ingredients of Meprazole, which is Prilosec in human terms. And Gastrogard reduces the amount of acid that's secreted in the stomach. Uh, the treatment's very good. Um, the treatment um, is given once daily for 28 days, but it is expensive. Um, Ulcer Guard is a preventive. Um, it's, a, it's the same drug, but it's given at half the dose. Um, again, it's expensive, but most of these young horses in training, um, these young valuable horses in training, are, are given this every day as a prevention. Um, and uh, the treatment can be very, very effective. So how do we prevent gastric ulcers, reduce stress, uh, monitor the diet, let the horses eat as many hours per day as possible, um, increase the amount of forage, reduce the amount of grain, 
Uh, be careful with anti-inflammatories as they can certainly lead to ulcers or exacerbate the ulcers. Um, keep the animals on an effective deworming program. Um, and then these animals that are at high risk, young horses in training, it's good to put them on ulcer guard as a preventive. So if you end up working in a, in a barn that trains young horses, you will come across gastric ulcers um, and you'll have a little bit of idea what's going on um, with this syndrome. Pretty common um, uh, in, in certain horses, um, especially thoroughbreds and young horses.